In this episode, we will talk with Sasha Krasling about psychology of investors, how to raise capital from wealthy individuals, what are the best strategies when you come to the call and to the meeting, how to prepare yourself for the investor meeting, and also what to do if you hear no. This is Anastasia Rivado. Subscribe to our channel. We talk about raising capital, building investor relations, and expanding your investor network. Welcome, Sasha. I am so happy to have you here today. We spoke about fundraising all around uh, venture funds, startups, and even nonprofits with you. And I'm so excited to bring your expertise to our listeners and viewers. Um, let's start by knowing a little bit more about yourself. Thank you for inviting me. I'm so happy <laughs> you invited me. Um, I follow you program and uh, so it's, it's a pleasure. So I have um, on, almost 20 years of experience in fundraising um, and I had a prior life to fundraising, which was in the, more in the PR and marketing. I have a journal background um, uh, as well, but um, 20 years, my expertise of working with um, major nonprofit organizations or uh, global nonprofit organizations, um, doing fundraising and working on a, um, a philanthropic advisory role with uh, foundations. Uh, so I kind of have experience on both sides of the table. And um, in, uh, in the past six years, I've been on a com in a consulting role and more an advisory role, working um, with um, um, with various size of organizations, um, not only as a professional on institutional side, but also working um, in a um, in a consulting side where I wear many hats. Um, I and, bet. Uh, <laughs> um, and a lot of it is um, working with people where I help, um, um, you know, so I diversified in my practice in the past couple of years. So it started as, um, you know, helping um, nonprofit organizations, again, of various size and in various countries. So I only, not only have done work in, uh, as a consultant in the uh, United States, but uh, in the various countries. Um, um, helping anywhere from strategy assessment, fundraising, and board development, working with board engagement um, and uh, leadership development. But um, I diversified in the past couple of years and uh, started, um, which was the one of the most exciting developments in my career, and started working as a kind of investor relations uh, specialist because a lot of fundraising and uh, leadership skills development that I've uh, honed over over kind of a tenure of my career is um, it's very transferable. And I developed a network of people that I know in an investment community and especially in Silicon Valley over the years to kind of uh, transferred uh, into um, working with a couple of startups and uh, working with the fund. Um, and um, so I... Um, um, what made you choose this path? Why did you uh, focus on fundraising? It's such a heavy lifting uh, of the world especially raising for nonprofits. why did for you nonprofits, decide uh originally 20 years mm -hmm. ago yeah um uh, it was a serendipity i wasn't it was not a choice you know sometimes we just fall into something that i just a perfect fit for us i actually never it was never a choice uh, but it was um uh, just a very lucky um you know, just a lucky break for me. And it was a perfect, uh, perfect fit for who I am. And, um, and I just uh, became purpose of life for me. Um, I, I found myself. <laughs> well, let's, just... let's give our audience a little snapshot into who you are. We, I know you personally a little <laughs> bit. You are an extremely likable person. You have incredible communication skills. I do think those at least those two assets are invaluable to fundraising. What do you think makes you good at it? So what I've learned over the years, 
you know, and what I, you know, and it's not only, you know, I'm not that smart. I'm smart, but not that smart. So I've learned how to learn things from other people and observe over the years. So I've heard someone tell me that uh, someone who's much more senior and had a phenomenal career in the fundraising. And and she told me, Sasha, remember one thing. There's a difference between fundraising and development. And you're not a fundraiser. You're a development person. And I was like, it kind of struck a chord with me. It was years ago. I was maybe, you know, not a newbie, but, you know, not, you know, not as experienced as I am today. And it kind of stuck with me. And then over the next couple of years, it was just, I couldn't get rid of that thought. And then I understood a couple of years later what she meant. What happened is that there's a difference between fundraising is a skill. It's just, it's a skill. But what makes a great fundraiser is being a development person. When I'm in the business, what I do actually, I create relationship. I develop relationships. I develop um, um, uh, people, investor relationship. I mean, your world, it would be called development, uh, develop, investor relationship. In the world of nonprofit, it would be donors or um, board lead, lay leaders or uh, do, um, you know, engaging uh, donors and the boards. Like, there are different you know, jargons, depending on, uh, you know, industry. So everything is a relationship, you know? And so, yes, it takes a certain personality to, to do that. And, you know, I happen to have that personality. However, over the years, I had to learn certain things, no matter what kind of personality you have, you actually have to learn a lot on the job. Um, uh, and, um, and I also had to love what I do and learn certain things because fundraising. So, so number one, it's actually, so you, ha- I have to learn the difference between fundraising. So fundraising is a skill. It's like a, it's a tool. And, and what I was doing, I was actually a development person, right? I was developing relationships. So I have de- a relationship that I developed over 20 years, 15 years, 10 years, depending where I met those people. And I have those relationships and I'm constantly working on, maintaining those relationships of, uh, you know, if I met a person yesterday or I met them 10 years ago or 20 years ago, it's constant maintenance. It's constant, you know, continue to develop those relationships. You can never kind of give up. So you have to have a certain personality, certain skills that you develop over the years to kind of maintain that and know how to do that. Know how you have Number one, you have to have personality for it. Number two, you have to learn the skills how to do that over the years. And then you have the fundraising skills when you need to fundraise. Um, I think what you just said, like you're just going through it because I know for you it's your everyday life. But to the people who are listening, just uh, really let it sink in you what uh, Sasha just said, that it's a development role it's not really a transactional role you need to develop relationships and as you mentioned you have a lot of very valuable financially valuable relationships in your network in your pool you've been friends with partners investing with uh, quite a lot of wealthy individuals can you give us a snapshot um, what's happening on their side when entrepreneur comes to them and pitches something, tries to get money from them, what's happening in their mind? How would you advise entrepreneurs to approach entrepreneurs and fund managers? We have both watching this channel. They're both trying to raise capital from wealthy individuals. Uh, What is the biggest challenge you see they're going through? You always have to keep in mind those people get bombarded with so many requests like that so you if you already got a meeting and you're sitting in front of that person you already have a shot so you have to kind of remember that so getting to that point already kind of amazing opportunity okay that that's number one number two whether you have a relationship or somebody like me who has a relationship brought you there so you already have an opportunity okay so it depends on the situation so there is always 
they're, they're so everything is multiply determined. So I cannot go through all the scenarios right now because there are multiple scenarios. But you already, whatever it is, got you there, already got you an opportunity, right? So the point is that you have to be extremely well prepared. You cannot come to that meeting unprepared. You have to, so part of being a development person, I know everything there is to know about the person I have a meeting with. Okay, so I don't come to the meeting unprepared and the person who I have a meeting with already prepared for that meeting too. I will never allow for them to be unprepared for the meeting I'm setting up for them. So they know why they are at this meeting. I will never waste anyone's time. Okay, unless they just want to see me for chit chat and it's, it's actually a cultivation meeting, it's a completely different story. So there are different kinds of meetings. But if a fund manager or whatever, you're coming there to raise money and you're doing an ask, it's an ask meeting, everyone needs to know why they are there if you're asking for money. So if this is the question that you're asking me. So no one wastes the time. And then there is a, there is different um, stages of the ask of the meeting that we need to go through. So it's actually... <laughs> Um, they're, they're different, depends on the relationship and, and who you're with or whether you're doing it yourself or whether you're doing it with somebody else. There's different stages, but everyone needs to know why you're there. That's like, I think it's essential. So you don't waste any one thing. People who are wealthy or whatever, who essentially you're asking for money, you are, if you ask, you never want to waste the time. And you want to don't want to waste that opportunity, and you don't want to. Next time, if you have to come back to them, you, they know they have to know they trust you. So the reason I have maintained those relationships over the years, number one, I was always very honest. You know, um, your integrity is everything. My integrity is my bread and butter in, in this business. Um, and your discretion is bread and butter in this business. I want to ask you, what do you think? Because you mentioned integrity and being honest. And I personally 100 resonate with it. But if you are raising early stage, start, if you're building an early stage company, right? Or it's a first fund, you don't have a lot of numbers yet. And there is a common, there is a common notion on in a venture world is fake it until you make it. Um, what do you think about this philosophy? I think that it doesn't work because nothing ever that fakes it makes it. And we have so many examples of that because we all know that non, you know, 99% of early stage companies don't survive. And investors know that. They actually know that. So if you come there and you say, listen, this is who I am and this is what I'm proposing and I don't have the numbers yet and this is what the risk factors are, but I'm working, I'm willing to work really hard. And this is what I'm offering to you. Okay. As necessity always wins. The, I Listen, if you're coming, and, and it also depends what kind of investor you're coming. If you're coming to a sophisticated investor, they know exactly what the name of the game is. You know, they're sophisticated investors. They know exactly the see through you. If you're coming to family kind of a, you know, office and, People there just invest because they very diversify the portfolio. It's a completely different conversation you're having with them. But whatever the conversation is, why would you want to have that kind of um, um, reputation that you fake things? Because if you if your business fails, and I know entrepreneurs whose businesses fail, and they get up and they start a different business, or they have an exit and they start a different, and the second one actually doesn't do well, but the third one, I've known people, like I've been in this business for long enough, where I actually raised money as donations from people who are extremely wealthy and have a couple of exits, and they and I watch them build these businesses and fail and start something new and it's phenomenal but the reason people invest in them is because they have that integrity they're honest and they actually share the reason why diversified my portfolio as a consultant is because I became jack of all trades because I've learned a lot I know things about technology about biotech about this because I've had to learn a lot about different businesses because of my donors and who started trusting me with their businesses, essentially, um, when I became a consultant. Um, and they started teaching me about their businesses because that kind of a developed relationships I build with them. And um, they, 
very sophisticated people. And I um, I often, I just want to build on what you said. Um, I think when a fundraiser comes to a meeting uh, and they are trying to show more than what they have, they are putting themselves in a weaker position rather than following what you advise, just being straightforward with your numbers. And I believe from, you know, mentoring entrepreneurs, fund managers as well, uh, often when they're, they're trying to create a bigger picture of themselves because they're comparing themselves to wrong players on the market. And uh, by doing that, they're losing instantly. So they should stop comparing themselves to others. You know, maybe somebody who just raised 100 million overnight, the famous stories, right? That are always overnight. Always, ten, always. Ten look, years at, look at them. Yeah. Overnight, <laughs> right. And focus on the strong sides that they have. And I think that's where you help a lot with helping them to tap into what do they have and how they can craft their, their negotiation in their favor. Also, what's important, I also help people with the understanding that asking for money is the most unnatural thing for people, okay? And being a fundraiser, doing this for 20 years and asking for millions of dollars sometimes. And, you know, um, I know it, it took me, and I was asking for charity. Like I started where, like I asked people, yeah, there's no return really, on charity, yeah, right? Yeah, the, something. I mean, there are studies and studies been done. It brings people joy. It, it's like you know, it's like, and still, it's the most um, fundraisers and charity also need to be trained and constantly go through this training. And you know, we need to be trained and told to that you know, it's the most uncomfortable things, and that, that's why it's very hard to, to be fundraising even in a charity work, and they're very difficult to find good fundraisers and that's always it's a turnover and it's a struggle because it's one of the most difficult things to do to ask people for money even though when it brings people joy to give like it's scientifically proven it brings people in contempla contemplating to give money to charity brings people joy so asking money for your company is the most uncomfortable thing to do, right? You know, very few people who are actually bold enough and comfortable doing that. It really needs to be, it's a skill, right? Um, and um, and it's, a it's like a muscle, it needs to be worked on or it needs, somebody needs to coach you to do that. So this is where I coach people and explain to them how to do that and how to get through that hurdle of, thinking about it to be more comfortable with that, how to prepare for those meetings and how to actually physically conduct those meetings. Like, you know, when you ask for money, what do you do after that? Like, how do yeah, you yeah, prepare for that? Let's <laughs> go into the most terrifying part of the investor meeting. I think that's why most of the people are so afraid. In re and because it, that's why it's uncomfortable because you're so afraid to hear no. What do yeah. you do if you hear no? How, how to interpret it? How not to yeah. lose your conscience and what to do after. So, so I, I think there are different kinds. First of all, people, so, you know, when you ask for money, you made you ask, right? Like you, whatever, you ask for X amount of money, whatever money you need. And so what people do, they keep on talking. Okay. They're like, but, and they start justifying why they ask for that amount and why they need it. They already made the case. They already did the pitch, they showed everything, they asked for money. Show and this is why we need that X amount of money. Stop talking. That's it. Take a sip of water, start writing notes. <clears throat> People are afraid of uncomfortable silences. You ask for money, you have to stop talking. That's it. Stop. Silence. Let the investor think through this. They need to, you don't know what's going on in the head. Maybe they expected a higher number. Maybe they expected lower number. Maybe they didn't expect anything at all. I don't know what you don't know what's going on. Okay, maybe they're ready to write you a check. You have no idea. You need to stop talking and let them think because you need to. Um, and then what happens when you start justifying? You can talk the investor out of writing your check if you you're gonna say you know extra things that don't belong there or you don't let them think through. So that's kind of, um, I think, um, not being afraid of the silence is the most important thing. It's the most uncomfortable thing that happens during the ask. 
That's number one. Number two, I think uh, what happens is there are different kinds of no's and you need to be prepared. This is part of preparation that I go through. There are different kinds of preparations that I go through. So you have to be prepared for different twists and turns during the conversation, but the different no's you have to be prepared for. And one, one of the no's is that you have to ask what no means when they tell you the no. They no, like you don't have the money now. Will you have money in two months? Is it like, is it hard no? Is it no, we're not ready for you right now? Is it no, um, I know, come back to us within a year? Is it no, we're too small for you, we're too big for you? What, that, what does this no mean? So we have different kind of no, because no means different things to different people. So we need to figure out. And you always have to get a, leave the meeting with a plan, okay? Even if you heard the no, you figure out what kind of a no it is. And even if it's a no, you have to figure out what the plan is. So I have a company that became uh, evolution right now, a little bit over a billion dollars. It's in um, cybersecurity space. Uh, he got so many no's <laughs> on his first um, like a seed round. Um, so many no's, oh my God. And the same people who gave him no's gave him the seed money still gave him seed money because he kept coming back to them because there were different kinds of no's because he didn't have a, a Stanford uh, degree because he didn't have um, partners who had Stanford degree. I don't know. He didn't have IT background. He, but he, he had an idea. He was determined and he wouldn't take no for an, those no's for an answer. That, those no's didn't mean anything to him because he knew what he wanted to do was the right idea. You know, and, Eight years later, he's over a billion dollar company, evaluation company. So yeah, it's like you have to understand what this no means. Okay. Now he's starting another company. All these people are begging to give him the seed money. Wow, that's an inspiring story. I'm really glad you shared it. I think for a lot of the listeners, it will be a relief <laughs> that even after I know, uh, especially after I know, there are many more opportunities if you just keep following up. Uh, on this note, I want to wrap up this interview. I know there is so much more you can share with us. Uh, that's why I would love to see uh, you more here. And I think there will be a special product with Sasha Krasny uh, within our educational program as well. So stay tuned. And if you have any questions, just drop it below the video uh, or below our post or send us an email. We'll be happy to get back to you and help you with your fundraising. Sasha, you're the best. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If this content was useful for you, click the like button, subscribe to our channel, and we will see you in our next episode.